Brilliant. Okay, look, thank you very much for attending today. Uh, my name is Simon Rowell. I head up market development in the Future Networks Programme at DSIT. Um, we've got a pretty packed agenda this morning, uh, this afternoon, sorry. Um, and I think really what we want to try and achieve today is give everyone that sort of in-person overview of what we're trying to achieve with the one competition. Um, we've got some great speakers. We've got the team uh, from the Future Networks Programme that will go through uh, the competition in detail and then we've got some consortium pitches later on um, if we just look at uh, the agenda today um, we've got a introduction by keith burke who's the program director of the fmp uh, program in a second uh, followed by a uk tin introduction uh, by nick uh, which will be uh, given that sort of context of uk tin uh, we then go into an overview of the competition and look at the different elements of that, starting with HDD, high density demand, um, the RIC and software automation piece, uh, silicon RF and RAN hardware. We'll then go into a break uh, because that'd be quite a lot of information uh, to go through uh, for that bit. We'll then look at how to apply, so the dynamics of the competition, how you can get involved um, if there are interests there, and the sort of things you need to be aware of around that. Um, we're going to follow up with a QA and a because I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions that people have based on what they've heard earlier. Um, and then really we're going to look at that consortium building. So there's going to be a number of pitches um, that Bob Driver is going to uh, uh, chair um, for people who may want to work with other members uh, in the audience and beyond. Um, and I think that will be very interesting to hear. So that's effectively what we're going to do this afternoon. Um, there are no uh, fire alarms planned, so if you do hear a fire alarm, it is real. We have a, a muster point at the back, uh, at the left, just at the rear, um, but there's also plenty of exits uh, here um, and, and to the rear, so hopefully it should be all, all okay. Um, and with that, I'd like to welcome Keith Bullock, who is the Programme Director for the Future Networks Programme. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Fantastic to see so many people here. Welcome also to the people joining us online. So, as Simon says, yes, I'm Keith Bullock from the Department of Science, Innovation and Technology, newly, newly formed uh, department, I should say. Um, and I'm, I'm Programme Director for the Future Network Programme, so that's the 5G Test Beds and Trials Programme, which I know many of you here will be familiar with, which is just coming to its end and the Open Networks program, um, which is, I'd say, about halfway through. And this Open Networks ecosystem competition represents our final push on that and is our biggest amount of funding we're releasing in one go so far. Um, it's a coincidence that that's happened at the same time as we've moved from DCMS to DCIT. But I'm also, along with the team, very hopeful that it is a sign that we will be able to have more funding more often with more certainty and give you all a much greater line of sight as to what our intentions are around policy and how r d funding will stem for that in the whole telecoms area so um in a moment i'll hand over to nick um, from uk telecoms um, innovation network um they're really important to us their job um among many other things is to keep us in touch with the real world, with the market, with the businesses, with academia, with the vendor organizations to make sure that the competitions we're launching are relevant and are likely to be of interest. And of course, they're also a resource and will become increasingly a resource for everyone else as well, because one of the jobs is to try and make it easier to signpost where the support from government is and to guide you towards it. So a key role for, for UK TIN for us. As Simon said, um, plenty of people from the Future Networks programme team here. And I think if nothing else today, I would urge you to talk to them. These are people who have read a lot of bids um, over the years. They know what good bids look like. Um, they know all about the rules of engagement. And they know what working with government on these things is like. And on that point, I think there's a couple of things for us. I think we're always learning, inevitably. We are trying to be uh, easier to deal with as an organization, but we do have, I think it's important everybody comes into this eyes open, that um, taking money 
um, from our department in this area isn't quite the same as taking it from some other parts of government. And there's a, a couple of reasons for that. I just thought it's worth mentioning these. One is that um, one is that we are very closely tied to policy teams. So we don't sit alone and we're not just doing R&D for its general goodness. We are doing R&D triggered by very specific policy objectives. And so we care a lot about what happens in these projects. We're very actively interested in them and are resourced with our technical experts and other teams to sort of engage throughout. So that's one reason why we tend to stay closer. Um, another is that this is um, part of what's called the government major projects portfolio. It means it's right there up with things like HS2 and things like that, believe it or not, in terms of the amount of scrutiny it attracts. And that inevitably has some pass on effects some demands on our team to make sure we are doing this right, that we are spending money or, or giving grants appropriately, and that we are keeping track of how things are going. So there is an overhead, um, important to be aware of that. We are trying to minimize it, um, but there are a couple of things. So for example, so if you can talk to the team today, we've got the technical people, we've got Dale from the commercial side, um, we've got lots of people with lots of experience, and we have lots of top tips. For example, there are things about time pressure. It's bounded in a way which isn't always very helpful for an R&D project. We are very strict on the financial years and we're very strict on the end point too. It will pay off hugely for you to have a project manager and a finance professional ready to go from the moment you are notified. There's one thing we have learned so clearly um, with our projects. So please bear that in mind. Um, and there are other things too, just to bear in mind, I would say, take a look in the whole package of information you've been given. There is, um, I think there is um, our grant agreement, our grant funding agreement, the GFA, as we abbreviate it to. This isn't a negotiable thing. So please don't wait till you've won uh, the bid before you take a look at that. Really useful to get the lawyers to look at that and make sure it's okay. It's worked for us on how many now 70 odd projects over the last five years so it does it is rarely used in anger um, it does work um, but we don't really have time to negotiate it so these are the types of things i hope we'll get a chance to talk to you about today i'll be around for the rest of the afternoon like i say there's a whole bunch of us from the team uh, just sitting here wanting to answer your questions and uh, wanting to encourage you to bid into this competition Okay, so I hope this afternoon um, gives you all the information that you need, um, that you do find it all helpful and encouraging. And I'll hand over to Nick. Thanks, Keith. So uh, today is convened by the UK Telecoms Innovation Network. Um, it's right in the center of our agenda to organize events like this, to bring the innovation community of the UK together and have it pointing in the right direction towards common goals. And I'll talk a bit about, about what, what that really means over the next couple of slides. Um, but in terms of we are convening the meeting, we are not reviewing the application. So if you've got a complaint about lunch, complain to us, but complaints about anything else, it's somebody else. Okay, just, it's not our money, just for the avoidance of doubt. Right, so first slide, please. In your own time. Do I have to click it? <laughs> dear, oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> Every day is a school day, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's me, Nick Johnson. I've been in the job six weeks. I think that's the last time I'm going to mention how long I've been in the job because it's uh, starting to get boring. Um, so what's the, what's the, the, the UK Telecoms Innovation Network started its life really in the uh, Telecom Diversity Task Force report from 2021. And in there, you'll see, if you read that cover to cover, you'll see a lot of the themes which have recurred over the next couple of years and, and reappeared in the UK tin competition, which we succeeded at and which I joined earlier this year. Um, and we'll see that those themes in a second. But it was, it was formed in response to a view of the R&D, the innovation community in the UK that looked a bit like this, just 
a whole, all of the concerned entities all looking in rather different directions, all moving in rather different directions. Um, inward investment was rather mystified, unless you were actually already established in the UK, knowing where to spend your money was a, a, a difficult question for many people interested in investing in innovation in the UK. And the other thing that's wrong with this picture, which we'll put right in the next one, is there's no customer in this. There's no kind of orientation of this R&D effort in a common direction. And that's, again, one of the most important things that UK Tim is, is nudging to put things in the right direction. So lining up all of these entities in a common direction, something I've been calling true north, of course, in this direction, it looks a bit more like true east, but you get the idea. Everybody looking towards the goals of the customer community, right? So that means globally, not just in the UK, but globally, all of the fixed and mobile large telcos, all of the tower codes, all the system integrators, all the non terrestrial network operators, that's to say, satellite operators, all of the private shared neutral host operators that may be small beer today, but tomorrow, who knows? There are, th I think, um, Ofcom announced their thousandth shared spectrum license uh, earlier this year. This is a growing segment that's really important. And of course, one of the customers for all of this is UK policymaking, right? So we can't forget, as Keith mentioned earlier, this is all has a policy agenda that it's meeting, right? So we'll see a bit more about that. And then of course, over in the left-hand side there, getting investment organized so that it knows where to go. Where does the money go um, to make this make these engines start to turn, start to pick up speed. This is, this is our goal, if you like, from a UK tin point of view. And how are we going to achieve that? We can achieve that in a bunch of um, work packages. So these are six important ones here on, on the slide. Of course, it's communications is key. And this is part of our agenda today is to communicate the innovation agenda of the UK and oil the wheels of that in as much as we can with a series of events such as this uh, over the two years of the program, the re remaining two years of the program. Um, the front door service, so this was a, a name that was first used in that telecom diversity report, um, was reused in a, in a report that DC or DCMS commissioned, uh, which may, as many of you may have taken part in, to understand the importance of having a single front door for the UK innovation community lining that up in an online way so a, a, like a google search engine database of databases that, and that enumerates and makes searchable makes findable makes discoverable all of the r d resources of the uk whether that's from a production point of view or a consumption point of view as well as that providing human specialist guidance um, to customers to companies including customers who are interested in investing in r d in the uk shaping the long-term R&D agenda of the UK, convening, UK TINs convening a series of special interest groups, that's to say expert working groups, who are providing impartial, inclusive input in the research abilities of the UK, the gaps in the UK, but most importantly, the key objectives of the customer community. So the operators in all of their stripes, as we saw on the previous slide, UK TIN's objective is to make sure the R&D community, the innovation community in the UK, is serving those, uh, that customer community in a global context. Um, and related to that, we talked about supply, I talked about um, policy objectives, supply chain diversity, incredibly important still uh, from a UK point of view, globally, to be honest, all of uh, many, many countries are looking at this from a, this point of view. And so that mapping the UK innovation capability there and translating that into product then becomes key to diversifying the supply chain and supply base for, for telecoms networks generally uh, around the world. And then of course none of that would be complete if we didn't think about adoption and to a large extent the skills gap that exists, again, again noted in the 2021 report, the skills gap that means that we can do all the innovation we like if we can't deploy it we're just wasting our time, right? So let's make sure that skills gap is plugged from the, from the schools. Um, you know, that's a little bit outside of our agenda, but we need to think about how we're gonna get that going in schools, but through the regions and nations of the UK 
um, in all of its in all of the uh, elements of deployment that are important to to cover. So that's a kind of um, twenty thousand foot view of the UK teen activities here to bring innovation back aligned up uh, into the service of of UK PLC and global PLC uh, generally. So that's my overview for UK teen. I'm around uh, all afternoon as uh, as we all are, I think. So I can take questions on that uh, whenever you like. Thanks for your attention, and that's it from me for now. Thank you very much, Nick and Keith, for those introductions. So now we're going to get on to, I guess, the main event, which is the competition. Um, I guess the first thing to say is that um, you know, we've been thinking about the name of this for some time, and I know that everyone likes, uh, you know, DC to come up with a good name for their competitions and the different elements. But actually, the one competition does actually explain where we are on the journey, I think, because it is one competition involving a number of areas to advance the ecosystem. Um, as some people like to call it, they like to call it the uh, the one show competition. Uh, but we're not going to, you know, we're, we're going to stick with the one the uh, the, the one competition uh, as a name. Um, we've taken all the objectives that policy had, our policy colleagues had, over the last six months, twelve months, and really tried to crystallise that in to what this competition will look like. Um, and they have been set their objectives by, um, you know, the government at number 10. They have to translate that into, they have to do their research and translate that into strategic objectives and policy. And then they hand it to us as the program team to look how a competition can be developed around this. And as part of that journey, we've probably engaged with well over 100 organizations, I would say, both um, in the UK and overseas. Uh, we engage with a lot at Mobile World Congress and other conferences uh, leading up to this point, and many more uh, individuals uh, as well. So we, we've tested these concepts, I would say, uh, in a lot of detail. Um, and that's important because, you know, it's all very well having the objectives that we need to adhere to and move forward, but we also need to make sure that we bring the market with us. We have to make sure that the market will work with us and we can evolve this together because I think that's going to lead and we all believe that's going to lead to the best result all round. Um, and as part of that, we had a workshop in January. Um, many of you in the room uh, were at that workshop and we tested all the specific themes in a lot of detail. Um, we had a huge amount of feedback. People were telling us certain elements wouldn't work. The market's not ready for that or actually encouraged us and said, actually, we should do more of, of, of one thing as opposed to something else. And that was hugely encouraging because then we could refine the elements of this in a lot more detail. Um, and really what that meant is that we have quite a bit of confidence now, I would say, in the three themes uh, that we've developed. The first, as, as mentioned, is high density demand, which Graham's going to talk about in a lot more detail after this. Um, and it's really just trying to see where we can prove you know, open architecture in a high dense environment. And, you know, there are players in the market that are looking at this, are doing things in this space at the moment. But we believe this could be slightly accelerated. We believe this could evolve maybe a bit quicker. And we want, obviously, part of this competition to focus on that. Um, and we know already from the feedback we've got, there is quite a bit of interest in looking at this already, um, which is obviously very encouraging to us. The second element is around the RIC. We know there are a lot of RIC developments going on. We know that a lot of companies have already developed one, but we specifically want to look at the open uh, interface uh, at a near real-time or real-time environment, um, which is, is less developed in the market. We know there are certain projects going on around this, but it is less evolved. And we believe by having this strand as part of the one competition, we can accelerate that as well. And we would obviously be, uh, you know, very happy if there are people that would like to develop this further and look at this in more detail. And Freddie's going to talk about that in a lot more detail after after this. And then the final element is around RF hardware and RF components. Um, we know that there are various interoperability issues uh, around this at the moment. We know there are supply chain issues, 
not just in this country, but in other countries as well, um, and not just in radio-related environments, but other areas of technology and telecoms as well. But we believe we can just push this boundary a little bit further as well. We know there are certain organizations out there that are looking at this, and we believe that this funding can hopefully help accelerate that. Um, and Joe is going to talk uh, in a lot more detail about this element of the competition. So one of the obvious questions is, can we combine elements of this together? Do we just have to bid for one part of the competition or can we say, look at a RIC development in an HDD environment? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. We would like to receive a wide variety of bids. Uh, it could involve all three elements, potentially. Um, it could involve just one theme, but we are open to ideas on this. So if there are organizations or consortium out there with different ideas on this, we are absolutely open to hearing about that, and we would encourage that as well. And really, as mentioned, as, as Keith mentioned, um, you know, we want to advance the UK open ecosystem. We want to advance this as much as we can. We're not going to achieve everything. We understand that. It may not actually be achieved in our timescales, but we believe we can move the dial. And that's been proven with the previous programs that we've had. It's been proven with the tranche one interventions with Sonic Labs, with UK Tune, with the UK uh, Telecoms Lab being launched and other elements as well, such as Frank. So we know we can move this forward um, in the right way. And we hope and believe that actually the one competition can, can help achieve this. So the value is up to 80 million. Um, that is the, uh, uh, the budget we have, um, and it's available for all UK registered entities. Um, James uh, from the program development team is going to talk about the dynamics of the competition in a lot more detail, because we know there's going to be a lot of questions around that and the intricacies of applying and how best to do that uh, to, get, to get the best result. Competition closes on the 23rd of May. So, uh, you know, a quick sum is, is, is telling everyone that that's roughly eight weeks away. So it, it is short. It's not a long competition. Um, we have parameters that we need to, um, you know, fit into. And therefore, you know, we are looking at a short competition period. So I encourage everyone, uh, again, as Keith mentioned, to look at this very seriously and, and quickly. Look at who you might want to work with get project managers involved, get, get budget finance people involved, and really take this seriously from today, if you haven't already, if you are interested in applying to this, because it is a short window. From the end of May, we will go into a moderation phase. So um, the DSIT team looking at this will take all the bids, and we hope there'll be many, um, and we will start moderating each one based on strict scores. Um, we have certain rules that we have to adhere to, um, and therefore that phase will probably last around four weeks, about a month to moderate that. Uh, one of the key people in that process will be Dale. He's head of our commercial um, in DSIT. He's gonna sit on the Q&A panel, um, and obviously he's here if there's any questions around sort of the intricacies and rules and regulations of that. Notification to successful parties will be end of June. So, you know, 23rd of May, uh, deadline, moderation phase and then parties informed by the end of June um, and we're looking to mobilize on that by the end of summer early September so yeah, again you know these are quick time scales but we believe that you know from feedback we've heard as well people actually enjoy that they want things to get going and, and you know we've got time scales internally as well um, and then really uh, that that's the competition at a very high level um, as I mentioned James is going to talk about a lot more detail around it because I'm sure it's led to a lot more questions from everyone here um, we do have a Q&A session uh, after the break that will be uh, involving the theme leads uh, around all three areas it'll be involving commercial uh, some of our technical advisors um, and uh, uh, James again who's looking at the overall competition so again if there's any questions around that please uh, use the Q&A uh, uh, period for that. We've also got a central mailbox. So if you, you, know, you forget about something and then you want to ask something when you've got home or later on in the week, you can email that mailbox and we will get back to you, um, uh, you know, from, from that. And again, that's very similar uh, to previous competitions that we've run around that. So that just gives you a, 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 you know, a quick overview of that. You know, please do take it seriously. It is a good opportunity 
Um, and, you know, we believe that, uh, you know, we can obviously advance what we need to do as a government, and we hope that the market can advance uh, some of your objectives as well as part of this. So thank you very much. Uh, Graham, let's go into a bit more detail on HDD. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Simon. And good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Uh, high demand density. We thought we'd start with an easy one for everybody. Um, my name's Dan Fast. I'm the uh, program development lead on high density environments. Um, today, I'm going to tell you a bit about why we've chosen to make these environments um, a central part of the one competition. I'm going to also talk to you about what we're uh, looking for in bids. So, historically, um, high demand density or HDD environments, dense urban areas or airports, sports venues, major public events, they prove themselves to be vitally important drivers for growth and innovation in telecoms in a way that maybe far outdrips their geographical size. And maybe this is because they represent some of the most challenging environments for the performance of any mobile network. Technically, we know they're quite tricky. So coping with high density of demand for connection and data alongside high levels of user mobility can for many networks mean stretching their capabilities to the limits. And commercially, they're really high impact when people are at a football match or a festival or a train station and they just can't get connection to meet up with people or to share their experience. They really remember that and they really bear that in mind when they're making their next purchasing decisions for which mobile network they want. Which is why we, we've heard from network operators, they have the highest levels of uh, performance expectations for products used under high density conditions. And why historically we've seen uh, products or solutions developed high density environments then percolate across the ecosystem and improve the quality experience for all mobile customers. Today, high density is only growing in importance to most network operators, even though, I mean, it depends how you define it, but we think roughly 1% of the UK landmass covered by uh, mobile networks is could be uh, classified as high density. They drive, a vast, they drive a vastly greater proportion of mobile traffic. We think perhaps 20%. By the end of the decade, we think that geographically, HED areas will have maybe doubled in size and the traffic, the traffic density in these areas will also have doubled. Yearly data traffic could rise maybe five or 10 times. So all of which is why we can't really talk about driving open RAN take up without also looking head on at uh, the requirements of HD environment, which is what we're hoping to do through the one competition. On the one hand, we're helping industry, we want industry to evidence the areas in which open RAN solutions are already at or are close to parity with proprietary solutions when it comes to high density environments. On the other, where there are gaps, in uh, open RAN performance, we're hoping that the competition can help close these gaps and move open RAN solutions closer to performance levels seen elsewhere. And we're asking for bids to do this in three ways. First, we want the deployment of a mobile network in a live HDD like environment. So this deployment environment should be capable of testing or demonstrating aspects of open RAN performance equivalent to a public facing mobile network. So while the deployment environment could be a public facing mobile network, it could also be another environment which offers a, a reasonable proxy for the types of challenge faced by a mobile uh, public facing network. So this could, for example, improve, uh, include use of private networks or fixed wireless access or neutral hosting, providing they're carrying or could be induced to carry levels of traffic or mobility comparable to high end public environments. We also want to see, uh, as part of any bid, an element of testing, evaluation, optimization. And finally, we want to see a, a solid approach to sharing and determination of lessons learned that adds value to the wider industry. That might include looking where we can use UK TIN, for example. Now, I'll come back to a few of these things towards the end, but I just wanted to next look at what we mean by high density in, in a bit more detail. And technically, what we think high density environments have in common is they involve four things. High user densities. So lots of active users in a particular place at the same time. 
and this puts intense demand on a network. <coughs> high traffic densities, so high data volumes per square meter, because people in high density situations tend to do lots of things like social networking or video streaming. Third, and linked to this, high density areas can have high peak and average data uplink and downlink rates, which can cause network congestion. The fourth feature is maybe high levels of mobility and large volumes of handover between adjacent cells, layers, frequency bands. And these types of characteristics can be seen, yes, in dense urban areas, but also specific locations such as airports, sports venues, uh, railway stations, underground stations, major public events, festivals, crowded beaches in the summer, maybe research centres, um, maybe some factories, public events, South Bank on New Year's Eve, you know, there are quite a few places like this. That said, it's quite important to recognise that not all HED environments are the same. In the exact profile depends on the deployment context. So, for example, a crowded sports stadium could well have a higher average user density than a train station and different uplink and downlink usage. So these characteristics have worked okay, um, mean that networks can have specific and high expectations for RAN functionality in HDD areas over and above those for the rest of the networks. These include things like uh, the need to support multi-layer cell architectures and the sharing of bands, bandwidths and networks. The need to take account of challenging power consumption, weight, size constraints, and to support the highest spectrum efficiencies. The need for high performance features that support things like energy saving, carry aggregation, load balancing, and account for high levels of user mobility. And features that also enable operators to respond to a wide range of uh, RIC and software uh, management requirements. So in your bids for the one competition, You'll be expected to demonstrate how, how open man solutions specifically can meet these high expectations of network operators and overcome some of the traditional barriers to adoption. And it's in this section, I'm going to look at maybe some of the issues you might want to consider with your bids based on our conversations with industry and the insight we've had to date. This is very much non definitive. Your views may well differ. Uh, I'm sure they will, but the goal here is just to get you thinking. So, first, thinking about perhaps performance and feature parity. How could you help demonstrate the extent to which open LAN equipment is already able to match or maybe close to matching the performance and feature sets demanded by network operators for HD environments? You could look at this through various lenses. So for example, energy efficiency or quality of experience, electromechanical performance, spectrum efficiency and throughput. Or if there are known to be performance gaps how might you use this competition to close these gaps and move open man solutions close to the performance levels expected by networks? So, for example, thinking about um, energy and spectrum efficiency. It's an area in which open man solutions have been said sometimes to lag behind traditional RAN, um, in part due to reliance on COP servers. If this were the case, then bids could look at how that gap could be closed. So, for example, through RICs or XAP development or improving the energy efficiency of power amplifiers or considering the use of advanced chip sets like ASICs. Second area could be looking at managing user mobility. So as we've seen, large numbers of users on the move can place pressure on networks in areas such as handover management and load balancing. So your competition bid might therefore include exploring the extent to which existing RAN, open RAN solutions could be put through their paces in this area. For example, you could test or demonstrate mobility in a live HD environment between different RU and DU vendors. Or again, if there, were, if there were gaps, obvious gaps in performance around mobility, you might look at how you can test for this and start to close the gaps. So in hardware, it could look at maybe testing interoperability between macro cells and small cells. In software, you might look at the role that the RIC and X apps could play in load balancing and traffic management. Third area of challenge uh, might be RAN hardware architecture. Um, in particular, we know that in HDD areas, massive MIMO features and performance can be seen by MNOs as key for managing the macro network. So to what extent could a live demonstration uh, test the extent 
to which open man MIMO solutions can achieve or move towards performance parity with traditional equipment, including around areas such as size or weight or power or capacity. And looking at areas for improvement to hardware or software could play a part in this. So again, maybe using RIC or XAPS or ASICs, uh, alternative uh, high performance chipsets to improve power efficiency and flexibility, perhaps looking at some of the standards that underpin these things too. Or even to flip things slightly, you know, you might want to explore whether alternative ne network architectures such as small cells or neutral host or FWA could represent a viable alternative to MIMO in HDD areas. So two final points here. Um, first, systems integration. To what extent are there particular SI challenges that are particular or unique to HDD environments? If there are challenges, how might these be tested and overcome as part of a bid focused on demonstration testing? Are there, for example, potential uh, security challenges specific to the use of open man that your bid could explore? And let's not forget commercial and cultural challenges too. To what extent is total cost of ownership of open man solutions a barrier to network take up? Are there ways in which bids could help demonstrate comparable TCO for open man to traditional man? There might be room for innovation in commercial models that support open man or help open up open man use cases in HDD environments. So for example, around shared hosting. So hopefully this provides a bit of food for thought, it demonstrates the sorts of bids we might find interesting, but as I said, it's by no means an exhaustive list and we, we, we thoroughly welcome proposals focused on other, other challenge areas. So to wrap up, I'd like to come back to a few practical things about putting an HDD focused bid together. So first, choosing a deployment environment. We do expect to see deployment of a network in a live environment. This environment should be chosen to enable testing of open man solutions against one or more of the performance challenges faced by a public network in an HDD area. As I said, these, deployment, these environments could include dense urban or transport hubs, train stations, public events, any areas in which there are issues of high user or traffic density ability to consider. Well, obviously, it, this could be a live public network. There are other environments, as I've said, that could be proxies for this, such as private networks, FWA, neutral hosting. But if you do use a proxy environment, you must evidence in your bid how these relate to the sorts of challenge and performance requirement faced by mobile networks in public areas. Um, for this, you might want to draw on our draft set of HDD technical guidelines, which we're hoping to publish shortly. Second, you might, uh, as Simon was saying, you might want to look at links between HDD software and hardware themes. So as we've seen, there's a number of ways in which bids might suggest linking software and hardware development together as a means to which open man solutions can reach or move towards the sort of performance levels expected in HDD areas. So we're therefore more than happy to consider bids that, that combine any elements of any or all of the three one competition strands. Um, and my colleagues will talk more about hardware and software in a moment. Third, within your bids, we expect an element not just of deployment, but testing, evaluation, and where relevant optimization performance. We want to see how you'll communicate the results of your trials in a way that will help that will land with network clients. This might include via blogs or white papers, dissemination events. Finally, you can't do this without building a strong consortium. Typically, this consortium might consist of a network provider, a number of open man solution vendors, bring in hardware, software elements, and systems integration expertise. Uh, it'll be up to you to, to work out sort of what you think the optimum mix there is. You'll obviously need to find a usable deployment environment, the strong business case for resourcing the sorts of testing we're looking for. Think about how your partners might ensure that outputs are trusted by industry. So for example, is there room there for independent testing? So I think that's it for me. Thank you very much for listening. We're really excited about this competition and its ability to create real change. Um, I'll be up here, have to take questions later, um, either in person or through the mailbox. Good luck with everyone's bids. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Uh, I thought that was fantastic. Um, and now I need to work out how to use this clickery thing.
uh, which should be pretty simple, hopefully. There we go. Uh, so hi, everyone. I am Freddie Gelati, and I will be talking you through uh, the RIC and software automation. So first of all, um, there's, a, there's a slide here at the beginning, and there's a couple of slides at the end of my presentation, uh, which are um, really for you to um, look at when you're going to provide the slides to you at the end, so you can kind of look through in a bit more detail at the, at the, at the text here. But fundamentally, um, it's important to understand that for this theme, we're interested in something quite specific, which is what we're calling the open near real time RIC. Um, and uh, it's important to realize at the same time that although this is something which is quite a specific thing, and I'll go through the kind of how we got here and everything, um, at the same time, it may be the priority for this uh, funding theme, but we're also keen to see any and all proposals in the field of software development, including those that are not related to the RIG, and those that dovetail with other themes in this competition, and I'll explain that in a second. So first of all, just to kind of give you the high level overview, why are we investing in software? I think generally speaking, the government is really committed to investing in software in the UK, and especially when it comes to telecommunications. We've got uh, leading strengths um, in software development and a great ecosystem in the UK, which you can draw on. Um, we've got particular strengths in AI and machine learning. We've got fantastic uh, globally leading academic institutions, which have uh, loads and loads of researchers in the software space, which uh, I think are really useful for you when it comes to doing your R&D. Um, and as I said, uh, software is key to the future of tele telecommunications as we move, move forward into things like 6G. Um, and it's particularly important for Open RAN. Um, which kind of brings me on to why we are interested in investing in software, specifically in the context of diversification. Um, we have a target, as you probably all know, which is to have 35% uh, open RAN in our telecoms networks. This is the target which all of the mobile network operators have signed up to. Um, and we need to get there through innovation. And software is one of the ways in which we can get there. So the kind of model that we envisage for how funding software leads to diversification is what I've tried to illustrate here, uh, which is where you, the ecosystem, coalesces to research new open network software products and services. You innovate on those products and services, you commercialize them, and then they are adopted by mobile network operators, specifically um, adopting open RAN on open networks technology. Um, and in so doing, we meet our target of 35% and we get to, you know, a more diverse uh, telecoms uh, network nationally. Um, why the RIC specifically? Well, we've identified um, a number of benefits, which I'm sure you all know about, about why the RIC is really, really attractive um, in the software development space, why it's important for Open RAN, and you know these are kind of just four generally high-level areas, but I think they're sort of some of the main ones, which are the RIC helps with optimizing networks, it help, helps with automating processes and a number of features in uh, in Open RAN. It helps with cost reduction, um, and it helps with interoperability, which is kind of the name of, name of the game. Um, and I think. Um, there are a number of challenges at the same time when it comes to uh, developing the RIC and the ecosystem that uh, we have uh, in the in the RIC development space. Um, and uh, these were, these challenges were highlighted by you, the industry, in our engagement that we did in our research. Um, and there's kind of five uh, high level high level things which I want to bring out here. Um, the first is openness. So we're worried about this kind of situation where um, the RIC is developed by multiple different companies and you end up with proprietary or closed RICs which threaten development of an open ecosystem. But what we really need is, is openness in, in all of the interfaces and in all of the technologies which go into our network. So we need um, an open RIC as well, which I'll come on to in a second. Um, when you go and layer down into the apps as well, th that we identified a lack of interoperability in apps. Um, both X, X apps and R apps in terms of the RIC, in terms of how you integrate apps into the RIC and get them functioning as quickly as possible, which is what's something which we need to uh, be able to do much more quickly to make this technology more attractive. Um, there's problems with standards. Um, the standards are underdeveloped in our interfaces. We need to open up these interfaces. Uh, there's lack of support for SMEs, uh, which we need to help with, which is why we want to fund software development, especially among SMEs. Um, 
And uh, when it comes to data sharing and how you train the algorithms, uh, we have, we've identified problems um, in terms of how operators uh, engage with this whole ecosystem and how they help us on this journey. Um, and these are all things which we really, really need to address. Um, so that kind of brings me on to my you know, original point, which is about specifically the thing, the, 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 the target of our funding for this theme, um, which is a bit of a mouthful when you say it all in one go. It's a near real time open access and interoperable RIC platform and associated X apps. So I've kind of tried to break it down a little bit. <laughs> so we need, we need to develop a RIC platform and X apps and it's X apps because specifically we're looking at the near real time or as close to real time as possible. Um, and we need this to be open access, both in terms of the RIC and it needs to be interoperable. Sorry, it, it needs to, the RIC needs to be um, both open access and interoperable as do the X apps. So it's the whole kind of near real time ecosystem, which we really want to open up uh, as much as possible. Um, as I said, though, this is a priority, but it's not the only thing which we're you know, likely to end up funding. We want to see all types of open and interoperable, interoperable software development going on. Um, so, you know, if you've got something which meets this bang on, then great, and we want to see it. If you've got something which we haven't thought about, which hasn't been mentioned here, which you think is going to help us on this diversification journey and deploying open networks and open RAN, then great. And we really want to see that as well. Um, I, uh, we've, we've got a bunch of different use cases for, for the RIC and all of these use cases, and I think Graham actually did a really great job of explaining what a, a lot of these things uh, can do for us in the open RAN space, but um, I just highlighted a bunch of them here. Um, and, you know, this is all about, again, making uh, the technology attractive to, to, to operators. So things like energy reduction, super important um, in terms of making open RAN more attractive, but also just generally bringing down the amount of uh, cost and the energy use that our networks are making. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but, you know, spectrum management, optimization of coverage, security issues, traffic steering, the RIC covers so many different things. Um, and we're open to, to all of these things, as well as things which aren't on this list. This is just an indicative list. Um, last couple of slides. So the, um, as, as I said, we have this issue around um, public and private operators. I've spoken to a number of people in the development of this uh, concept. Um, we really need um, data to train these algorithms. And that data is going to come from, from live networks, right? So it's either going to be public or private ones. A lot of people have been asking me, do we have to have a public operator on board? A lot of the public operators don't necessarily want to uh, work with this quite yet, although some are starting to kind of suggest that they're interested. You don't have to have a public operator, a, a public MNO on board in order to, in order to do this. But, um, I think it would be super helpful if you if, if you could get someone on board in it to, to do this work. I think it would be really, really beneficial, which is why also private operators are also fine. And a lot of people have been talking about um, campus networks being used to train algorithms. And that's that's also fine. We don't actually have any requirements here. Um, as uh, Graham and Simon said, uh, you can combine um, uh, HDD software and hardware themes in your bid. So if you've got uh, a, a kind of product product or like an ecosystem of solutions which fit a number of different themes, then that's completely fine. We, we're really, really keen to see those kind of ideas as well. Um, as I said, openness and interoperability are really the name of the game here. We really want to uh, make uh, this so like software and, 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 and the RIC technology as open and interoperable as possible. Um, and we kind of see you doing that by um, forming a consortium with uh, a range of different, um, uh, different types of organizations. Again, we don't have any specific requirements here. This is just an indicative list. But, you know, we imagine that you might want to think about partnering with vendors, obviously, public or private operators, as I said, hyperscalers, cloud service providers, coding houses, RTOs, which is research technology organizations. So that's things like uh, the Catapult Network, other kinds of public entities can be involved as well, um, universities or other, uni other, you know, organizations which, uh, you know, you think are going to be really beneficial for uh, developing this technology. Um, and then finally, this is really for you to kind of take away at home. I just wanted to point to this 
uh, set of text which um, has been pulled straight out of the guidance. Um, we have, although what, we're, what I've said and what we've all said time and time again uh, is that uh, this is something we are prioritizing. It's not something that we, it's not the only thing we're going to fund. However, when it comes to the open near real time RIC, we have some specific things which we are looking for. So that's things like, so, so that, that is this concept of a, of a neutral platform which we can use to develop new X, -X, X apps, which are themselves open and interoperable. Um, IP, which supports this, um, and then also outcomes out the, out the back end. So overall, you know, we're looking to make open RAN generally and the software generally more open and interoperable. We also want to bring uh, together um, the telecoms and the software communities in the UK. So if you can evidence how you're doing that as well, that's really, really helpful. Um, and then again, uh, as I've mentioned, you know, improved engagement among pu public or private network operators with this specific technology. Uh, is something which we are really, really keen to see as well. Um, and that is me. So thanks, everyone. Uh, and now I'm going to move over to Joe to talk about hardware. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Freddie and Graham. I think um, Fred done a really good job summarizing our, our priorities in the um, HCD and um, software uh, themes, but now we come on to the real uh, meat of the question, which is the actual hardware infrastructure equipment itself. Um, I don't really mean that, of course, you know, everything's equally important, but it does provide a good uh, segue for me to kind of transition to the first thing I wanted to say, which is I'm going to talk about the challenges that um, the priority challenges that uh, for the for the hardware ecosystem. But before I run through those challenges, I first wanted to remind us of why the government is investing in you know, open networks in the first place. And it is, of course, because we want to see a more diverse supply chain for the infrastructure equipment itself. And ultimately, you know, that is the hardware equipment that I'm talking about. And we want it to come from more suppliers than it currently does or than it is um, uh, going to, you know, if, 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 if nothing changes. So this is really what we're describing here and what we've described in the guidance is really you know fundamental to achieving our program's ambition for open interface networks to play a major part in the country's national infrastructure um of course we want that to happen there are various kinds of barriers to that happening to there are barriers to changing the market to be um, more open um, some of those are commercial in nature um, or, or financial in nature or um, about um, resources, human resources, skills and, and capability within a company. But some of them are to do with the um, challenges of uh, the advanced technology itself, um, which is to say that this stuff is, is just really complex um, and that it's just more difficult for new entrants to the market to make progress uh, in these areas than um, it is uh, for incumbents. So what we're trying to do is help level the playing field um, as much as we can. Um, uh, and what I'm going to be doing is highlighting some of the key ways in which we think we can do that. And hopefully that will help you understand um, more about uh, the best way to best getting the most out of the funding that we have available to you in the, the form of grants. Now, what I'm not trying to do is to prescribe what you must do in order to receive hardware, for, to, in, in, what you must do in hardware in order to receive grant funding, like both Graham and Freddie have said, you know, these are priorities, they're not um, uh, prescriptions. Um, so what I'm going to cover and what you'll see in the written guidance as well, um, it's not meant to be an exhaustive list. Um, what could be done is just, you know, uh, what we understand to be the most important areas for achieving our objectives for uh, adoption. and. What we've been talking about, what I'm going to talk about, is um, it's based on the experience that we have built up over the past couple of years of fund, of the existing grant funding uh, projects, um, just say the Frank projects that I'm sure most of you are familiar of by now, and based on feedback uh, from industry, which is, includes uh, many of you. Um, so hopefully it will align with um, your understanding and your priorities and your thinking of the, the market as well. I also wanted to point out that we've undertaken quite a bit of dedicated research into the current state of the, the, 
open networks market and the ecosystem. Um, and that research is taking into account trends and ambitions, not just for the national public networks, but also for private networks, neutral hosts, and the public sector. Um, so everything that we um, that I'm going to say and has been said, it kind of um, uh, by default we tend to talk about the you know the the MNOs and the, the national networks, but it does apply to the whole sector um, uh, uh, as well. So I think that's important to to bear in mind. So. Our ambitions um, at a high level um, are to accelerate development and maturity in the areas that you can see on the screen now. So first of all, performance and features of components. That means um, this is really about making it so open RAN hardware offers a performance and feature set that is competitive in the real world market, um, you know, relative to incumbent single vendor solutions. Um, the case for why something is competitive can be made in a number of the number of different ways and so we're open to different takes on that um how you make that case doesn't have, just have to be about um numbers on a chart showing you know extra teraflops or gigabytes or whatever it could include um better compatibility in the software ecosystem um or improving security of components or or, or something else entirely um back to the ambition so in, in uh, second ambition interoperability that's um, referring not only to open RAN components working with each other, but also working with legacy systems. Uh, and uh, total cost of ownership is a major ambition for when it comes to the hardware equipment. And that's really about getting to the point where open solutions are competitive, you know, on, on, on total cost of ownership with single vendor uh, incumbent uh, solutions over the course of their, their lifetime. Um, so that means uh, things like overcoming barriers, um, like smaller economies of scale, just less maturity, um, uh, and an increased reliance on third-party integration, because these are all things that are kind of inherent to uh, the open, open networks compared to, to, to single vendor ones. And what this is about is closing the gaps, um, or the perceived gaps between open man equipment and you know, the status quo, so to speak. Um, so that we'll eventually have a much more diverse group of suppliers in the supply chain and ultimately uh, more secure and resilient networks as a result. Um, so I'll move on to the priorities themselves. Um, if there was just one hardware priority, uh, I had to pick from all the various um, pieces of uh, feedback and uh, experience uh, feedback we've received and experience of, you know, doing the Frank project so far, it would be chipsets. Um, and that really goes to the heart of a major challenge of open RAN, which is ensuring that the, the hardware equipment itself is able to meet the various performance requirements of the networks in the real world. Now, there are many microprocessors throughout the RAN, and I don't, uh, I won't claim to know what they, what they all are, but this is particularly <laughs> important. <laughs> There's a microprocessor doing its job, diligently <laughs> as ever. Um, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, there are many different microprocessors in the RAN, but, I, you know, one, one, that's particular, one area, not one processor, one area of the, the RAN that's particularly important but is the baseband uh, unit, which involves a lot of the processing, heavy lifting for communicating with the, the, the core network. But when we talk about processors, it's not all about raw performance. Um, power consumption is a major factor too. Um, that directly impacts the total uh, cost of ownership and the physical form factor requirements as well. And you know, we believe that addressing this challenge, in addressing this challenge, it's a, it's a priority to develop uh, chips and server uh, server equipment that is specifically designed and optimized for open RAN deployments or for open network um, deployments in the real world. Um, the best way to go about that um, is uh, not something that we're trying to tell you or impose in any way, um, or even that it's not something I think I know the answer to. There are a variety of approaches um, that you could take. They span the gamut from commercial off-the-shelf servers running generic CPUs, which is perhaps how open networking was um, envisioned when, when the, the, the movement first started. Um, uh, you can go from there to all the way to specially designed ASICs on custom servers, and there's various combinations of um, uh, hardware acceleration in between. And each approach 
comes with its own set um, of trade-offs. These are the kinds of issues that have become, or we think will become barriers, and we want to help the market to progress and eventually solve these. Our priorities are about ensuring that processing needs are met, as I've just described, and that there is competition and flexibility within that sector of the market as well, so that, that one platform doesn't dominate um, in order to, uh, that's because in order to, we want to allow the baseband unit and other areas uh, of processing demand for them to be properly customized, optimized, and innovated on, you know, in, in the future as well. It's, um, but it is also about um, uh, ensuring that performance is competitive and, uh, and the feature set is competitive with the incumbent solutions from single vendors that we are familiar with. Um, moving on, uh, software, and this might come as a bit of a surprise, it might seem slightly odd I'm turning to, to software now, and my colleague Freddie is just taking you through our, our software priorities, but I wanted to highlight the fact that optimized software is also a priority for supporting innovation um, in chipsets and other forms of hardware too. So here I'm talking about software to enable and improve the hardware uh, components. Um, such as the baseband unit, rather than software to manage and improve the, the network like, like Freddie was. So if you're considering proposing something that's focused on developing um, a hardware component of some kind, um, you should not think that it would be um, in any way confusing or detrimental to your bid to include a software element, because in fact it would be quite the opposite. Um, so I want to give a few examples of why we're talking software in a hardware section, kind of why it makes sense um, uh, in order uh, to uh, use software to improve hardware. So some of the things that kind of could happen, we don't, but perhaps we don't want to happen. Because um, uh, software has the potential to, you know, if, if uh, to prevent compatibility, if it's locked to, to um, certain uh, processing platforms, this can stifle development and innovation in the process. Lack of software support can also make it harder to support um, niche or specialized uh, applications and use cases such as HDD that my colleague Graham was, was outlining earlier on. But on the other hand, software has a lot of potential too to enable um, uh, 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 hardware to reach its full, full potential and open source software, something we're interested in particular, has, it can unlock some of the um, principal benefits of, uh, of open RAN. Um, and uh, uh, it's something that is widely used in other enterprise applications. So we think there's a lot of potential there for helping re fully realize the benefits of, uh, of Open RAN. Now, I talked about chipsets already, um, about processing um, uh, platforms, and uh, the number of uh, competing platforms is already, from what we can tell, is already set to grow in the coming years. Um, uh, talking about baseband processing platforms for open networks, and that's a good thing. However, much of that growth is expected to be based on the ARM architecture, and that's currently less widely supported with optimized software and x86 um, equivalents, and that's something we believe needs to be uh, addressed um, uh, because that could uh, has potential to become quite a significant barrier to um, widespread adoption and commercialization. Um, and we also want to use software uh, in this context to reinforce um, the principle of, of openness in, 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 in open man equipment, because a siloed ecosystem of closed proprietary software support could damage some of the benefits that open networks have the potential to bring. And that's why we're prioritizing openness and portability in the, in the software ecosystem when it comes to open man uh, processing. Um, I've spoken quite a bit about uh, 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 chipsets and the baseband unit and the related uh, software, but I don't, I don't want to make it seem like the rest of the hardware in the RAN is not important too, because, because it is. And during our research and engagement, I'd say um, the radio unit was the main challenge highlighted to us after uh, chipsets. Um, and within that, power efficiency and feature support were probably the key challenges within that. And, in the, uh, the research period that I was referring to, the statistic that jumped out, and you may have seen this before, is that around 40% of the base station's entire power consumption comes from 
radio unit and that this tends currently to be more optimized in traditional single vendor systems compared to open ones. So it's a priority to see this addressed for us um, and for open radios, radio units to be competitive on power um, with incumbents. Um, and that has a, a significant impact on the total cost of ownership, which is one of the priorities that I would prefer to earlier on. But the same also goes for other performance metrics um, and the feature set. And also the size, the physical size, weight, dimensions of the thing, they can also impact total cost of ownership when it comes to having to package in um, cooling requirements and make allowances for those, for example. Um, so anything which impacts total cost of ownership to a, to a large extent is among our priorities. But um, I've highlighted power consumption because it's likely to be, to continue to put strain um, on networks because data traffic is, is, is growing, is expected to, to continue growing and with it power consumption uh, grows um, uh, as well. So that's why we've highlighted, um, uh, highlighted this as a priority area from investment. Um, but there's more, there's more to it uh, than that. Um, I think it's safe to say that over the past period of say six months or so that we've been doing this research and developing this competition that um, uh, that those areas that I've just outlined for our top priorities to focus investment on but they're not the only ones we recognize there are other challenges in need of investment and I want to make it clear that we are keen to invest in those as well um, chief among those are probably challenges of uh, integration, uh, system integration. Graham's touched on that already in the context of, uh, of uh, uh, HDD, um, and challenges of security. And these are challenges of the wider Open RAN ecosystem too, not just the hardware equipment. But developing hardware infrastructure with these in mind can help solve these challenges. So it's important for us for these to be uh, considered in the same context uh, of, uh, of development. In systems integration, we conducted quite, uh, quite extensive research in this area and found the main barriers are more challenges to do with insufficient operability, which being what are notionally open uh, components, um, uh, and challenges with building modern integration skills and capability in the right places in the ecosystem. Um, and of course, the actual task of integration is more complex in uh, an open network in the real world because they have to live alongside legacy networks but how the physical equipment is designed will make a real difference in that real world marketplace when it comes to security and open ran uh, for all its benefits you know open ran has raised um, new security concerns um, now how valid those concerns are you know opinions will differ but they they are there and um, these challenges are not um, just around the nature of open technology it's, itself, but they're also to do with commercial issues around whose responsibility is it anyway, and how can it be, how can security be assured when that responsibility and the data necessary to kind of um, meet those assurances is split across different organizations. So there's a lot to be learned uh, and progress to be made in these, these areas too. And challenges like these, um, Challenges like these, um, alongside things like interoperability and compatibility more generally, are challenges that we see kind of wrapping around um, the ones that I've already outlined and that you'll see in the, the, the guidance. So when it comes to arranging a project consortium, I've tried to visualize it here on this uh, uh, slide. A project's focus might be in one particular component or group of uh, components that you you can see I've outlined there with the, the dotted lines, but it, it will, you'll often also need to account for uh, compatibility, both in a physical sense and software-wise, um, interoperability with other RAN components, ease of integration with legacy systems, and security of the component, both technically and in a practical commercial sense as well. These are always factors that need to be taken into account as well. Um, in conclusion, um, uh, a final thought for me on this, in case I've left you feeling um, less in the know than you were at the start, um, I just want you to bear in mind that overall uh, objective for hardware is simply to accelerate development and improve maturity and availability. 
So if you're doing that, then hopefully we can help you work with us and with um, other uh, colleagues in the system. So thank you for your time and I'll hand back to, to Simon. Thank you very much, speakers. Just some quick housekeeping. Um, someone has lost a set of AirPods um, and they're tagged to a name, Gerald. So uh, there we go, there we go. Okay, so we're just going to go into the next phase of this afternoon's session. Um, the next uh, bit is James, who's going to talk about the application process, which I'm sure uh, is going to be of interest to everyone here. So, James, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm James Boot. I'm a program development lead from uh, the Future Network Programs team at Department of uh, Department for even, uh, Science, Innovation and Technology. Uh, so you've heard from my colleagues this morning talking through the ins and outs of each of the different technology themes uh, and the scope of those as part of this competition. So I imagine you're all itching to hear about uh, the actual logistics of how to apply uh, and I'm going to talk you through those along with uh, some of the eligibility criteria that you and your consortium should be aware of uh, as part of the application process. Uh, and some general tips for how to submit a good quality bid to DSET. Uh, so as you can see on this slide, um, it touches on the sort of key events and deadlines as part of the application competition process, uh, some of which were summarized by uh, Simon earlier this afternoon, uh, but it's always worth reminding you of the key ones. Uh, so the ones to be aware of uh, are that the competition closes uh, at one minute to midnight on the 23rd of May uh, later this year. Uh, any applications submitted or attempted to be submitted after that time will not go through. Uh, so we strongly advise from previous competition experience that you try to submit all of your documentation well in advance of that timeline in case of any last minute IT troubles, as some, sometimes can happen. Um, uh, successful applicants uh, will be notified in late June, uh, and we have a, a mind to start project delivery uh, in September uh, this year, uh, and all projects will close uh, in uh, the 31st of March 2025. Uh, so I wanted to go through some more detail about the actual competition application process, uh, as well as the assessment process from DSET's side. Uh, so, key thing to flag is that each uh, consortium should have a uh, project lead organization uh, uh, nominated as part of the application process. Uh, they'll be overall responsible for the delivery and financial management of projects, and they'll also be responsible for submitting applications uh, to, the uh, to, to the competition. Um, uh, as a, a small change uh, compared to previous competitions, uh, rather than submitting your uh, required materials to uh, DSIT via an email address, uh, we're instead carrying out the application process via the government's Find a Grant site. Uh, so please do make sure that any applications are submitted via that portal well in advance of the deadline. Uh, following competition closure uh, on the 23rd of May, um, DSIT will then conduct a SIFT um, uh, against the eligibility criteria uh, for all applications that have been received. Uh, any applications which, um, uh, for whatever reason, do not meet all of our eligibility criteria uh, will not progress to the next stage of assessment and will be notified at that point in time uh, of our decision not to take them forward. Uh, all eligible and in-scope applications will then progress to the triage assessment uh, that DSIT will carry out against the first two questions in the application form. Um, these are the ones focusing on the overall objectives of what your project will be looking to deliver against our competition scope uh, and the technical aspects of your projects. All those receiving satisfactory scores to move to the next stage 
will then uh, have their entire bid uh, assessed. So every single question would then be scored by the DSIT assessment team. Um, the following assessment, um, DSIT will then um, uh, notify all applicants of the funding decision uh, and then progress to the uh, GFA mobilization stage for all successful projects. Uh, successful projects should, should expect to uh, be able to sign a GFA uh, grant funding agreement um, within two, uh, 10 weeks of the notification of uh, our funding decision. Uh, and all eligible and uh, in scope applications that have bid into the competition uh, are uh, able to receive assessor feedback uh, upon request uh, from DSIT. Uh, so we touched on uh, some of the eligibility uh, criteria. I wanted to go into a little bit more detail about some of the key ones that you should be mindful of when forming your consortia and drafting your bids. Uh, so this competition is op open to applications from consortia across the UK. Um, our definition of consortia uh, of a cons um, more, so two or more organisations drawing funding from DSIT. Um, consortium partners uh, must be a UK registered business uh, research and knowledge dissemination organisation, charity, public sector organisation, or research and technology organisation in order to be eligible for this uh, uh, funding. Uh, project work must also be carried out within the UK as part of this competition. Uh, organisations without a UK registered office are not eligible to receive uh, DSIT funding, uh, but are still able to um, participate in projects without that funding. Um, as has been the case with our previous competitions, uh, high-risk vendors are not permitted to participate in, cost in consortia, uh, either as a consortia partner or suppliers to projects. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, organizations which, are, uh, which have previously received funding from DSIP programs or are currently receiving funding from them are welcome to participate in this competition, uh, but only with uh, proposals that are clearly new in scope uh, and are adding value beyond uh, their previous project activities. Uh, so here's the really interesting stuff. Uh, subsidy control. So all funded projects as part of this competition uh, must be compliant with the UK Subsidy Control Act. Uh, so all, uh, as, is, as is advised in our guidance, all applying organisations should familiarise familiarize themselves with uh, the guidance issued by Bayes earlier this year, uh, which is signposted in relevant areas of our competition guidance. Um, DSIT expects projects to align with the Research, Development and Innovation Streamlined Subsidy category. Um, uh, and the guidance that we uh, signpost uh, clearly uh, sets out the general expectations, um, allowable expend expenditure, and details on restrictions under the subsidy control <coughs> act. Uh, this affects the uh, amount of uh, funding that can be allocated to different types of organization by size, as you can see uh, here on this slide. Um, uh, and also outlines an overall cap on any single um, uh, supplier receiving a subsidy of more than three million pounds. Uh, DSET also expects uh, funded projects to be uh, compliant with the experimental development with effective collaboration category, uh, which allows for a 15% uplift of the maximum subsidy, um, which has been taken into account with these percentages on this slide. Uh, and as well contributes to uh, DSIT's objectives around collaboration and dissemination of useful knowledge uh, within the telecoms ecosystem. Uh, applicants are also required to obtain their own independent subsidy control legal advice uh, and successful uh, projects will be expected to share that with DSIT in advance of signing a grant funding agreement. Uh, speaking of those eligible costs that are governed uh, by the subsidy control uh, guidance, uh, I wanted to touch on some key ones to flag with you as part of the application process. Um, eligible costs are those that you incur uh, during the delivery of your project for which grant funding may be claimed 
Um, so this could include the costs of your labor, uh, overheads, materials, subcontracts, uh, and travel and subsistence, among other areas. Uh, these eligible costs are intended to cover all activities directly associated with the delivery of your project. Uh, so some key uh, things to flag as you are preparing your bids are that total subcontracting uh, sub cost is limited to 30% uh, of the total project costs. Uh, no single organization can incur more than 70% of the total eligible project cost. Uh, and uh, for all research organizations and public sector organizations, the total level of project participation is set at a maximum of 30% of the total eligible project costs. Uh, if that wasn't enough information for you, we will be staging teach-ins specifically on um, subsidy control and commercial and finance aspects uh, in April. Uh, so I would highly recommend uh, that if you are interested in applying for the competition, uh, you register for attendance of these when the advert goes up on the UK TIN website. Uh, I also touched on uh, DSET's objectives around collaboration and participation. Uh, so we class co collaboration as the interworking with other publicly funded projects, uh, participation through UK TIN channels, and the wider ecosystem on topics of shared interest. Uh, our aim is that by combining the efforts of projects and their knowledge bases, producing tangible and useful outputs that can be shared and demonstrated, uh, the collaboration activities will help to foster the UK and international telecoms ecosystems. Uh, DSIT will monitor collaboration between projects, facilitate partnerships uh, to support these efforts where appropriate. Um, project partners must also sign the uh, OMP um, project participation agreement uh, as part of uh, uh, the grant mobilization process uh, and will be expected to work very closely with our colleagues at UKTIN in order to promote their work on the national and international stage. Uh, so you might have seen in our uh, application guidance that there are a number of mandatory documents to be submitted as part of your application. I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of each of these right here and now, but this is essentially your reminder that there's a lot that we are asking for, for good reason, uh, and that in order to be eligible, uh, you must make sure that you are ticking all of these boxes and submitting all of the documentation that we are asking for in the format that we ask for. Uh, these things, of course, include uh, the application form itself with all uh, questions answered within the word count, ideally. Um, plus all allowed appendices, um, project commercial forms for all project partners, covering the proposed costs for the entire duration of the project, um, two years of latest accounts for all partners within the consortium, um, and there are also a number of documents that we ask for to support the assessment of specific questions within the application form. Uh, so namely, the project plan and risk register that we ask for uh, helps to support our confidence in your ability to deliver the project from mobilization to closure uh, and effectively manage risks. Uh, and that will aid our assessment of the delivery section of the application form. Uh, the intellectual property plan, uh, which will explain your ambitions uh, around uh, patents and retaining IP resulting from your work. Uh, will help us to uh, uh, um, assess the the second section of the um, assessment form uh, around benefits and outcomes uh, and of course to aid our assessment of financial and commercial aspects um, we ask you to detail the finance and commercial roles within your consortium uh, uh, break down work packages by cost uh, and uh, to submit a set spend profile by month and I just wanted to also share some general tips around how to write a, a, a good quality application. Now, these may look like common sense, uh, but we've, we've done a number of competitions and it's worth reiterating these, I think. Um, first of all, read the guidance and all of the associated documents carefully. Um, there is a lot of material, and we do appreciate there's a lot of material to digest as part of the competition guidance process. Uh, but DSIT has done their best to try and spell out exactly what we want to see uh, in terms of a good quality bid 
Uh, so please do sort of work with us on providing the information we ask for uh, to help us with our assessments and get the most out of these projects that we're looking to fund. Uh, I would also ask uh, that you use straightforward language uh, and communicate your plans clearly and succinctly. Um, assessors can tell when a response is more jargon than substance, uh, and it certainly won't get you a higher score if it makes uh, their job harder in terms of assessing and understanding what you're actually looking to achieve. Um, and finally, don't go over the word limits. So we have got uh, word limits attached to each of the different questions within the assessment, uh, within the ap application form. Um, uh, assessors have been instructed not to review uh, bids beyond the word limit. So it will be highlighted when they receive those bids uh, if anything is over the limit, and they will disregard that. Uh, and that is because uh, assessors may have to read dozens of bids. Um, so we have to be very careful about how much work we're giving them because we could, we, you know, we don't want to blow their tiny minds with too much, too much to assess. Um, but uh, uh, they won't read beyond the word limit um, because that could um, unfairly advantage those who, um, you know, against those who have adhered to the rules essentially. Um, I also wanted to touch on the process for uh, questions and clarifications over the course of the uh, competition window. Uh, if you do have any questions uh, or require any more clarification, uh, please do contact us on onp.inquiries at dcms.gov.uk. Uh, there will be a public Q&A document uh, uh, live on the gov.uk website, which we will uh, regularly update um, with uh, questions received, along with our responses, uh, which will be uh, anonymized uh, wherever there are any details um, reflecting a specific organization. Um, uh, and we'll share that information with all people looking to apply uh, so that everyone has access to the same information. Uh, and worth re reiterating again that the deadline for submitting clarification questions is the 9th of May. So please do submit anything you have before that date. Um, I think that is all from me. So I think that leads quite neatly into the Q&A section of today's uh, agenda. Uh, so I'll ask, I'll hand over to Simon to lead that. And uh, thank you all very much and good luck with your applications. Thank you very much, James. Uh, could I invite the panel up, please? Um, and with the moderators, please, grab microphones, both in person and online. Okay, so you've had a lot of information today already. Um, I'm guessing there's probably led to quite a few questions from individuals. Do we have a show of hands at all from the floor? Yes, there's a gentleman down here. Kate, if you could... Uh, the honours. Before we do that, I should probably just introduce the panel and the experts we have in here. And we have James, who's looking after the application process. Joe on the H on the hardware, uh, RAN hardware. Graham on HDD. Uh, Freddie on software. Daryl, who's the commercial lead on any legal issues around this and the application process. Um, and then we have Ed at the end, who's one of our technical advisors. Uh, if some of the questions get a little bit deep. Um, no, please, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is not going to be a deep question, guys. Uh, so, John Ocus from Real Wireless. Uh, I always enjoy writing the public explanation. Uh, looking forward to doing that for recaps and so on. But that's not my question. My question is the first two questions in the application are triaged, which I assume means you're in or you're out. Uh, given there's three topics, and each of those topics both here and in the document are quite well expanded to say you can go beyond the edges here. Can you explain how the triage works, please? Do you want to take that? I certainly can. Um, I assume you can hear me. Um, so the triage process, as you said, quite rightly um, uh, identified uh, is against those first two questions. So the overall objectives and what you're looking to deliver, uh, as well as the technical aspects. Those are sort of quite over and like 
all encompassing kind of questions that give us a, a good view as to what you're looking to deliver. And so that's why those are the triage questions. Uh, so essentially the, app, uh, the assessment uh, panel will review those two questions as part of that initial assessment, score them according to our scoring matrix, which is also de detailed in the, the competition guidance. Uh, so uh, a score of uh, zero to, to seven, seven being the top. Um, and we've assigned a, a threshold, scoring threshold for that triage of four. Uh, so I believe that is a like a moderately good response. It's sort of on the on the sort of 50-50 on the cusp, really. So anything lower than that is not not enough to progress to the next stage, essentially. Uh, and so that's that's how the triage works. And they'll be assessed against those two questions. And if they both score four or above, they'll go to the next round. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Um, anyone else on the floor here? Yes. Gentlemen in red, thank you. Thank you. I'm John Redding, Parallel Wireless. So um, I was wondering, if you were receiving grants from the Frank projects at the moment, but you want to continue them to raise your TRR level, um, I think that there's potentially a slightly different application process, and there are slightly different rules with regards to the commercial impact of that. Are you able to give any more information on that? Frank application. I mean, Dale, do you want to? Uh, you're probably closely involved with that. I mean, it, it depends on on kind of how far you're straying away from the Frank um, project to start off with, as to whether it'd be more appropriate to put in a change request for that uh, additional work, or whether it is something that's so fundamentally different or significantly more funding and then it would be more appropriate to put in the uh, the bid but if you speak to your project manager um we can we can have a discussion and and guide you on what's more appropriate in your circumstances uh thank you i think i kind of know which is more appropriate but i just wondered kind of um you know as an example um entities are, are able to submit applications for up to three million um for a new project but is there any information on the kind of funding limits for existing projects? Uh, for existing projects, um, it would be kind of a maximum above what your current funding level is. I think that would be 50% overall, but we've only got a certain amount in relation to the scheme that we can grant in addition to funds already granted. Um, so yeah, it, it will depend. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do we have any online at all questions? We do. Yeah, there's quite a few. Actually. Okay, great. C could we switch to the online uh, mic, please? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I've got two along similar lines. Uh, do all um, the or all the participants need to be UK registered? And um, if not, how do non UK registered companies get involved? Uh, uh, yes, certainly. So uh, yes, so all uh, participants in the project, uh, all, all project partners uh, need to be UK registered. As reg uh, in regards to the process of being registered, I think, Dale, you might be able to speak to that a little bit more than I can. I mean, non-UK registered companies can be subcontractors into a project. Um, that would be the kind of most obvious way to be involved unless they wanted to be a non-funded partner, um, in which case that's acceptable. We just can't give subsidy. Okay, uh, shall I continue? Go ahead, yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, can you apply if you have uh, identified a project which may suit one of your three use cases, uh, but the proposed project builds upon a government funded asset such as fiber? Who wants to take that one? Uh... Can, can you repeat that one? <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you apply if you have uh, identified a project which may suit one of your three use cases, but the proposed project builds upon a government funded asset such as fiber? I'm, fundamentally, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, so like, you know, if you were plugging something into uh, a fiber network that already exists, open reach, for instance, that'd be fine. Okay, fine. Okay, um, we've got a number of people uh, trying to advertise their services, so I'm going to skip over those ones. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, x86 and ARM processors are mentioned. Does um, RASC-V have a role to play as well? Uh, it features uh, a custom compute architecture that's particularly suitable to optimize for energy efficiency. Yes. 
is the correct answer. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Fine. All right. Uh, this is this is one for you guys. Uh, with the summer holidays, will DSIT and partners be able to respond in a timely manner to hit the ten-week plan? I'm just reading it as it as it uh, yes. it's written. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. We have. We. We. I mean. You know, James outlined it that we we are we have planned for this and we've planned our like availability of resources in, inside the program. So um, summer it will not be an issue for us. I kind of put the question back to all of you: Will you all also be available this summer? Yeah. Okay. Uh, for HDD, is it required to demonstrate a specific uh, application scenario in the end, i.e., to have a public trial? Brian. If, if I understand the question right, um, you will be expected to do a live trial or a live demonstration or a live network deployment in a particular area. And that's, that is part of the, the entry level for the, the ATD bit. Okay. Okay. Um, we'll take one more virtual and then we'll go back to yeah, the Yeah, sure. Um, actually, we might want to move back to the floor because I need to sort through a couple of these first. Okay, I did, I did see a couple of hands going up. Uh, Mr. Scales. Me? Yeah. A um, couple of questions. So, first one is, is there a maximum value that a consortium can bid for? Uh, so, uh, consortium can bid for between 1 million and 10 million. Okay, thank you. Um, second question is, you've talked about a live network in the HDD section. Can you explain what you mean by a live deployment? What does that mean? A live HDD deployment. Green? Does it, does it need to be commercial, in other words? Can you explain what you mean by a live deployment? Live deployment? Um, a I presume a, a network that is deployed on a network that is used by consumers of, of some type. I, so, I mean, I, I can kind of... So real end customers. Is that, is that the definition? Means like not, not is, is there a definition of it? That's the question. Well, yeah, I mean, I think if you have, I mean, if there are particular questions, you know, I think if, if the requester particular things in mind, like is X or Y allowable, that's linked to a particular use case, and I'd, I sort of encourage you to sort of ask questions about that through the um, through the, the email form, um, just so that we can be sure we're giving you the right information. Um, Thank you. Just to go back to your first question as well, Tony, there is a maximum of three million for any one organisation, in addition to the one to ten million for bids. Yeah, I saw that. Thanks, Tony. I think Keith, did you want to make a comment on that? Well, asking a question of my own team here as much as anything else, but um, on this question about what constitutes live, I guess, would it be fair to say that our ambition and our ideal situation would, of course, be something that's being tested in a fully live environment, but if we get bids that are doing it perhaps in a more trial-like sort of situation, and you know that is the best we can get as long as it's meeting the aims uh graham that it is i guess providing a a comparator yeah. between you know um a, a test a good test of how well the open run equipment is performing in that environment then that's not going to be ruled out is that fair to say yeah i think so it depends what we mean by live here and i, I mean hopefully i sort of covered it a bit in my talk. I mean, there's a sort of live, which is live as in, you know, a full outdoor public MNO network in an HDD area. Now, that could be a scenario, but it's not the only live scenario we're looking at. Um, as I said in the talk, there are, you know, other deployment scenarios, which could be taken to be reasonable proxies for the performance of those full networks that we can still learn lessons from and still use as uh, environments in which we can help mature open our technologies. These could be, you know, private networks. These could be um, mutual hosts. They could be fixed wireless access. You know, I think in your applications, we'd 
like you to make the link between what you know why these are fair why these are representative environment how using these environments can help us learn more about the challenges of a full public deployed network but it is possible to use you know, those sort of lower grade ones where we're just testing so i hope that makes it too okay hopefully that covered that section there um yes the gentleman at the back please hi can you perhaps clarify um a bit on the review process and the panel and whether uh, the panel will be published. The review process. Um, Dale, do you want to take a, a stab at that one? Uh, what do you mean by review process? Do you mean the, the yeah. moderation of bids? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, we don't publish the outcomes for each individual bid. We only publish those that are successful, um, and we don't publish scores in relation to those publicly. Who's doing the moderation? Oh, uh, it's a range of people across the department. So for the technical aspects, we've got technical advisors like Ed to support us. Commercial and finance, it will be myself of the commercial and finance team, delivery questions. We have a series of delivery professionals. And then uh, there's a couple of other bits. And it's the relevant professionals within the department. It will all be assessed by um, civil servants or um, contractors to the department. Okay. Ish. Um, thanks, Simon. Um, James or Dale, I was wondering if you could tell me if there are any, I know there's an IPR framework document to be put in as a part of the application, but do you have any minimum guidance on what IPR, what do you, what do you define as IPR and how do you best like put a sort of a threshold around that? Definition of IPR. Yeah, so I can't talk too much about IPR as, as that's a, a section of the guidance that's been uh, uh, developed by uh, uh, other colleagues within within uh, um, DSIT. Uh, however, um, there is uh, a piece of uh, the competition guidance that talks about our expectations of what, what would be good to see in that section. If, of course, you require any more clarification on that, um, we can uh, go back to our colleagues in DSIT and come up with some more clarity as to what our expectations are, what would make a good IPR plan. Uh, and we can include that as part of the clarification log uh, that goes up on the cover. Okay, I'll read the guidance. Thank you. Thank you. Should we take uh, one online? Sure. Uh, can you confirm the subsidy levels available for public sector, charity, university, etc.? Can they claim 100% of the costs? Uh, Sub subsidy levels, who wants to take that? I suppose it's me. Uh, it depends on which category they fall into. So universities are typically 80%. Um, research technology organizations, 100% charities uh, and other public sector bodies. It depends on the way in which they're acting in relation to the funding. Um, so a charity acting in a charitable way would be 100%. But if it is acting in a way that would be the same as an undertaking, it's the uh, percentages listed earlier. Uh, local authorities will typically be 100% as well, um, which is the main category of public sector organization we fund. Okay. Yeah. Another one? Okay. Uh, a 60% funded project with the requirements of being in a consortium is very limiting to startups. If the overall aim is to progress um, open RAN and the wider telecoms R&D community in the UK, can these requirements be looked at given the merits of certain projects? Sadly, we're, um, we're kind of bound by legislation. Um, okay. I don't think that it's within a decent risk of appetite to go beyond uh, what Bay's published. So, Fair enough. Do you want another one or should we I'll go back? I'll take one more and then we'll go back yeah. to the floor, yeah. Uh, there, there is the opportunity to subcontract, as uh, Ed pointed out, so they could subcontract into a consortium, um, but obviously there's a limit on the extent of subcontracting within any bid. Okay, okay. Um, as mentioned, uh, one of the funding focuses is on Silicon RF and the other RAN hardware. My question is the technology needs to be uh, SI based and are you referring to SI CMOS? Can we take that one, Joe? Uh, not sure I quite grasp what the uh, question uh, is asking, apart from the last part was on 
systems integration, integration. Uh, is that right and and, and whether that's in, uh, included yeah i could ask i could ask the question though to clarify right. yeah, yeah so but i mean on 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 systems integration so doing something which you know it advances the kind of the, the state or the art or the maturity of systems integration in open networks whether it's on a hardware or software basis or a combination um is very much like within the boundaries of what we would like to see okay thanks okay um any more from the floor yes Hi, um, James knows how much I love process. Uh, so this is a question about GFAs. Um, at um, Telet, we've got really good at GFAs. Um, and we learned the lessons that Keith was talking about the first one, um, and have somebody in place to finance somebody at process. And we got our last GFA down to three months, and we were the fastest one to get it through. If you look at other projects, it took UK TIN, what, six months to get their GFA through? If you look at the create projects, they went, they slipped from September to January for their launch. Um, is there anything we can do to accelerate the GFA process? I'm thinking particularly, could we have a workshop where we got everyone involved, because I hate the word stakeholders, in one room and just thrashed it out rather than the toing and froing that takes forever? I, th I think we've, I mean, you quite rightly identified that, you know, uh, it's, it's not just Tell It that have learned from previous experience. DSIT have also learned from their previous experience with, with projects. We've cut down the amount of time that projects tend to take in order to uh, sign GFAs uh, dramatically over the course of uh, the previous program that we ran with 5G test beds and trials. Uh, and I think we've put all of those learnings into the guidance and process that we're undertaking for this competition. Uh, so I think that um, the 10 week um, uh, expectation is, is, is perfectly reasonable. Uh, I think it's um, uh, within the guidance that um, uh, all projects have identified uh, their mobilization team, uh, you know, as part of their applications. So who's going to be leading on the commercial aspects, who's going to be leading on financial um, uh, from their sides. And I think that's a useful learning that we're taking forward as part of this. Okay, I, I remain to be convinced. <laughs> um, we've only got a few more minutes. Uh, this gentleman here. Thank you. Thank you. Ezzad uh, Darwaza from University College London. I've got two questions and a comment. Um, one question is, is I, I presume a lot of these projects are expected to be university-led, uh, I'm sorry, industry-led, not university-led. Or is there any restriction on, on the leadership of any of these projects? Uh, there's no restriction on who can lead a project. Okay, thank you. So the second question specifically on the RF part. So thank you, the presentation was interesting, but there wasn't much RF in it. So there is quite serious RF work in the country, both in industry and academia, and much of the RF work, if it were to go into projects like this, it will have to be at low TRN level. It never is at high TRN level uh, if it were to have any impact. Uh, so how flexible are you about TRL levels? I mean, if we're looking at something which is closer to the R and D or closer to the R than it is to the D, how suitable would that be for these projects? Um, so um, the, 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 present, the presentation kind of reflects what we've heard. So you're right, the RF didn't feature in it um, that much. That's based on the feedback that, that, that we've received over the past few months. But I, I, I tried to make it clear when I'm but I'll reiterate now that it is still among our priorities, like we do recognize how important it is. As regard to TRL levels, um, we are flexible, is what I would say. With the, 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 like, I think what you're articulating about RF is that it, it, it's, it's, it's different for different aspects of the technology and different parts of the RAN, and we have not set um, uh, limits or goals on, on TRL levels for any of the different aspects of the, the projects that we're, we're looking for here. So um, it is absolutely possible to make the case for something at lower TRL levels. Like I stated in the presentation, it, it's about um, ex accelerating development and maturity broadly. And that's kind of it. So yes, we are flexible. Thank you. Um, and that's, that's great. We've, we've just got time for one more question. The gentleman at the back, please. Uh, we do have the mailbox and we are here for the rest of the afternoon as well. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Amol from Mavenir. Uh, based on your past experience, how many participants you expect in the consortium? Is there any limit? Number of participants in a consortium in the past, how many have we? There's, there's no limit. Um, I mean, we've got consortiums as low as two and as high as 
Oh, I, I think, 17. yeah, 17, I think, through uh, our last competition. Uh, you might want to think about how manageable that is as a lead partner. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. I know that was short, but we've got a lot to pack in this afternoon. Uh, we've got some very uh, interesting and exciting uh, consortium presentations. Mr. Driver is going to lead the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Everybody, let's get down to business, shall we? We've got. Um, We've got 12 presentations from real companies that want to talk about stuff. And um, I'm going to talk about, first of all, just very briefly, because I'm standing in between you and the companies, uh, some top 10 tips on building a consortium. And these actually date from 2020, believe it or not. Uh, it was, I think, Keith, you'll be very familiar with these because uh, we built them together, I think, and they were also advertised in the Innovation magazine, uh, edited by Simon um, back, at, back in the day. So we've had lots of information on how to put together a great bid, but it's worthwhile looking beyond that as to actually how to build a great consortium. So 10 top tips, and I'll go through them really, really quickly. First of all, project leadership one person that's in charge of the project is really important. You need day-to-day -day leadership, you need to have that person in charge. You need a project figurehead. It's a public money you're getting. So the, it's important to be able to explain to other people what you're doing and why you're doing it. So sometimes a project leader isn't the same as a project figurehead. Sometimes they're the same person person, often they're not. You need to have communication capability. So how to present, what is the content of what you're presenting uh, to the public uh, as you go through the project. Project management, things will go wrong. It's a project, you know, things are going to go wrong. You're going to have to adapt. You're going to have to be agile. So you're going to have to have a uh, effective management and that means the ability to deal with change you also think about actually what you're trying to do don't try and put in too many use cases too many tasks into the project you're trying to do do one thing and do it well if possible also if you've got a large consortium or even a considerable consortium, even a small consortium, make sure that you've got your approvals processes internally sorted out. And uh, don't underestimate the amount of requirements that um, DSIT will put on you when it comes to presenting your information and providing information. Obviously, it's public money and it's got to be stewarded in the right way. Um, openness and access to partners. If you've got a lead, a lead organization, there'll always be a lead organization. That organization shouldn't be a block to the other participants in the, in the partnership. Um, also, something I think is probably particularly appropriate for HDD employments. Sometimes this is outside. These deployments are outside in the real world, and you need to think about planning permission and those sort of real world issues of putting stuff on masts and what have you. Actually, that can cause a lot of delay. And one of the features of this, um, this competition is there ain't much time. So you've got to think about that too. And then finally, size of, well, last but one, uh, size of consortium. We've already covered this actually in the, in the questions earlier on, um, be careful of having very large consortia. They can be very difficult to manage and um, you need to be wary of that. And actually, I think I do remember a, one of the consortia for the 5DGT program. There was about 30, 30 organizations and it was quite challenging, I think. Finally, and last but not least, don't forget this bit because it's probably the most important bit of all. It's legacy and commercialization right from the beginning. You've got to think about 
how this stuff is going to actually be commercialized in the real world. So those are top 10 tips. Uh, they might be seem pretty obvious, but actually they're easy to forget. Um, now, what we're going to do is we're going to go through a process with uh, 12 companies. I think they all know the order that they're coming in. They're all going to get four minutes to talk about what they've got to say. And um, I think, is it Sophie? Sophie's going to hand... <laughs> Put up, the, put up the, the, the notice that says one minute remaining. And then after that one minute, I, I come along and drag you off, basically. So um, all in good spirits, but we do need to keep to time. Also, just before I, I, I ask for the first person to come up and present, um, I wanted to say that uh, UK10 has a supplier, a specialist from the supplier specialist service, uh, supplier support service that we're putting into place. And um, they're happy to help you if you're looking for a partner or you want some introductions. Obviously, there's lots and lots of people from DSIT here that can help you. But if you want to have some commercial discussions, talk to Tim Osbelton, who's at the back there, and stand up with Tim. And Roger, where's Roger? And Roger, Roger over here. So if you want to talk to either of those two gentlemen from UK10, they can help you. And so you can talk to them afterwards.